Coming off our last video, where we explored Windows for Workgroups, I mentioned that Novell Netware products were the 900-pound gorilla in the corner. Later, during the Hack Alt N Commander stream, hosted by DEF CON 201 of New Jersey, I got involved with exploring Netware live on camera for the first time. Since then, I've had time to read through the documents provided in lovely hypertext form while trying to learn the nuts and bolts of how to actually administrate this monster. So let's fire up the DeLorean and go back to 1993. I'm your host, End Commander, and if you enjoy this content, please like and subscribe. Let's step back a moment and actually explain what Netware is. In short, it's a dedicated network operating system that was available for 286 and 386 processors of the era. It did one thing and did it well, and that was to provide fast and reliable print services using Novell's IPX protocol. Unlike DAWs, Netware could take full advantage of the 286's protected mode without concerning itself over backwards compatibility. Furthermore, network clients were available for DAWs, OS2, Macintosh, and even Unix-based operating systems of that era. A large part of Novell's marketing at the time was showing, yes, it runs Netware. Netware's popularity began to wane through the 90s as Microsoft began aggressively pushing Windows NT as a cheaper alternative, and the world began to move away from the concept of a dedicated network operating system. Even a port of Netware server to OS2 did nothing to stop Novell's decline, and by mid-2000s, it was often nothing more than a forgotten memory. Windows NT would take the crown of king of office file sharing. The full story of Netware's fall for glory is a story for another day though. For the moment, I want to focus on what the Netware experience is actually like. For this video, I went with Netware 3.12 which was released in 1993 and was contemporary with Windows 3.1 and Windows for Workgroups. Netware's installation process has changed over the years. Up until version 2.0, Netware was able to boot directly from a hard drive using Netware's cold bootloader. Versions 3 through 5 require loading into DAWs before chaining into Netware. The final release, Netware 6, then restored the cold boot version. As such, either a boot disk or a small DAWs partition is required to use Netware. I installed MS-DAWS 6 to a 32 megabyte partition and left the rest of the disk space unobcated for Netware. This version of Netware shipped on both floppy disks and CD-ROM, so Oak CD-ROM was added to DAWs to take advantage of the latter. Installation is started by simply running the install program from the CD. This copies the base Netware files and server to the DAWs partition. Installation at this point is continued within Netware itself. The first step is loading the ISA disk driver, which tells Netware that we are using an AT compatible hard drive. This is followed by the load install command. Install handles, disk partitioning, system installation, and provides shortcuts for editing and managing autoexec.ncf and startup.ncf, the two files that control Netware's initialization process. The free space set aside at the beginning of this video was converted to Netware's sysPartition, which, as the name suggests, holds the core system files and folders. One interesting oddity is that Netware continues to have access to the CD-ROM device loaded under DAWs. This is due to the fact that DAWs is actually still resonant in memory, and Netware can in fact talk to DAWs devices, albeit with a massive performance penalty. The manual has a large section documenting this in detail. It took several minutes for all the files to copy across, at which point I still need to install updates and a network adapter driver. Netware 3.12 has several known Y2K bugs, but Novell's patch files are not hard to find. While it is theoretically possible to install patches from the DOS boot partition, I could not get this to work. The official instructions require loading the patch files from another machine. This of course meant I had to get network up and running. Complicating matters, the AMD PC net card is not supported by Netware out of the box. Instead, the driver has to be loaded from DAWs. The driver I have is for the later Netware 4, but it loads just fine on 3.12. The next step was configuring the system via Netware's two main config files, which is a somewhat unintuitive process. Startup.ncf is used to handle any early actions during the DAWs startup stage, such as load ISA drive. This makes the sys partition available to Netware, and then control passes to autoexec.ncf. Autoexec.ncf, on the other hand, runs once the Netware kernel is fully up and running. 
Here we need to load the IPX driver and bind it to localhost with a network identifier and hexadecimal. This is then followed by loading the PCNet driver, binding IPX to that interface, and selecting the IPX frame type and providing a separate network number. While this is all documented in the installation manual, it still took several attempts to actually end up with a working system. The unintuitive nature of NetWare would foreshadow what happened next. At this point though, we can load monitor which shows various statistics and shows that IPX is in fact loaded on our PC Net card. A quick check with Wireshark also shows that we are in fact successfully talking to the network. It's at this point an ugly truth shows up. Beyond basic setup, it's impossible to administrate a NetWare server from the server console alone. Besides install and monitor, the only tool of a user interface is edit, which doesn't even provide a file listing. Likewise, dir and similar commands simply do not exist. For that, we would need to move to a client system with the Novell NetWare client installed. Once again, MS-DOS 6 was installed, followed by Windows 3.1. The Novell NetWare client 3.1.2 was also installed, as this version was included with the server desks. Like the server, support for the PCNet NIC was not included in the default install. This was compounded by the fact that the NetWare client installer did not detect the driver disk, likely due to the client drivers being for a later client version. Nonetheless, I was able to get this to work after copying files and manually editing net.config to properly bind IPX. After a restart, a lot of messages are printed on screen as the NetWare client successfully loads. It was at this point NetWare's unintuitive nature re-emerged. Aside from a few small programs, there was no client applications immediately available in NetWare Client. More reading led me to discover that, by default, a Novell NetWare requester mounts the login utility on the F drive. With it, I could log in as supervisor. At this point, it was time to install patches on the server. The collection of patches I have exists in the form of self-extracting archives, and each are installed in a different manner. The main system patch is 312NTD which requires its directories to be copied to NetWare and then load patch 312 to be run on the server console to actually install it. In contrast, the Y2K patch required replacing files on the sys-partition manually, then the NetWare server must be downed, replacement files copied to the DOS boot partition, and then finally running lswap to replace code within server.exe. After restarting, the date code properly comes up as 2020. Returning back to the NetWare client, NetWare file paths can be mapped to local drive letters via the map command. A graphical user interface is also provided in the form of the session command. New mappings are created with the insert and delete keys, something not pointed out by the user interface and would trip me up later. Group broadcast messages are also available from session. In addition, there's a GUI interface for it under Windows that lets you map and manage network shares. More unintuitive behavior quickly became apparent, however. Mappings changed in Windows persist when returning to a DAWs environment. While this mechanism works, more confusion reigns in the fact that Network Client for Windows has the ability to make drive shares permanent. To clarify, a permanent share is one that is automatically made available and connected on system startup. While this may seem like a more user-friendly alternative, these shares are only automatically mapped when Windows starts up. As such, a typical user may have had to start Windows before exiting to DAWs to use Network Success. This is supposedly mitigated by the fact that NetWare supports and recommends the use of login scripts, which are essentially batch files that run on the client when the user logs in. These are supposed to be set by the network administrator to set up drive mappings for individual users using the map command, as well as perform actions like modifying the path variable. Now, I do want to emphasize a fact. I am intentionally using an older Novell client. This client was contemporary with this version of the server and would have been common on DAWs and Windows machines of the era. Later clients, at least in theory, improved many of the aspects of the user experience and the administrative tools I'm going to demonstrate. However, it also needs to be said that this was competing directly against Windows NT and Windows for Workgroups, which were both cheaper and had a much better user experience. A final wrinkle I discovered was that permanent shares are set on a global basis. If your computer was used by multiple users, the NetWare client might try to mount shares that you don't have permissions to use. The patching process may have foreshadowed it, but if the user experience for NetWare 3 was poor, the administrative one was not much better. Starting from the most basic utilities, NDIR lists files on a network drive, while NCopy allows copying files within a network server. 
While it is possible to do this with just standard DOS commands, these two programs bypass the network entirely and are also essential for managing Macintosh and Unix files. The server console could also be accessed via the R console. However, this required running load remote beforehand. The RSPX module must also be loaded for administration over a network. R console gives a one-to-one -one copy of whatever is on the server console screen. This is useful for checking monitor or installing add-on software. R console also provides additional functionality in and of itself, hidden by pressing the star key on the numeric keypad. Multiple servers can be managed at once through select a screen and a remote directory viewer allows netware drives to be viewed. The transfer of files to server works as you may expect, although it's not as useful as it appears at first glance. Directories are not copied recursively, which prevents it from being used for tasks like copying patch directories. Copy system and public files may look familiar, as we saw this option in install. Simply put, it's a mechanism for loading some netware software, for example, online help. I did not, however, use it during the production of this video. Finally, shell to operating system simply opens a DOS command line, although it is not possible to switch back to our console without exiting DOS first. Another essential program is syscon, or the system console. Syscon is responsible for managing users, trust permissions, and also allows the use of an optional accounting package for handling billing. It was at this point I needed to consult the netware documentation. Although it was easy to see the pre-existing supervisor and guest accounts, adding a new user stumped me. Once again, the secret is to hit the insert key on the keyboard, which then pops open the necessary prompts to let me add an end commander user. This prompts to create the user home directory and then provides menus for customizing user permissions as well as setting groups and other relevant information. Both the system and user login scripts can also be set with this utility. Netware actually has fairly advanced access control lists and the official manual recommends creating paper worksheets to work out various permissions for various shares. One interesting feature of note was the execute only flag which prevents an application from being directly read or copied by any user, even supervisor. The manual clearly states that backups must be kept as once sent, execute only cannot be removed. Another useful utility is Filer, which acts as a graphical file manager. Access controls can also be manipulated here, and for mixed environments, non-DOS files can also be reviewed and managed. This also acts as a supplement to the command line NDIR, NCopy, and Flag utilities. FCONSOLE, on the other hand, allows the administrator to view who is connected and what files they have open. There are a lot more commands in the base network install, such as those related to printer management, connecting to the B-Retrieve SQL Server, or even making a network bootable DAWs image. As we explore NetWare in future videos, we'll take a look at these as they come needed. Diving into NetWare has been something of a journey. Despite the user experience being less than ideal, NetWare itself is a solid piece of software, and it was rock solid throughout my testing. In addition, its IPX network protocol meant that network clients were essentially plug and play. There was no fiddling with DNS or other common network tasks required. The problem is that presentation often trumps functionality. On that note, I do hope to explore later versions of NetWare, as well as demonstrate its competition in the form of both LAN Manager and early Windows NT. If you're interested in seeing more, hit that subscribe button, follow me on Twitter, or hit me up on Discord. Until the next time, this is N Commander, signing off.